Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, so I think uh, yeah, the today's topic is going to be uh, managing your portfolio in a pandemic. So the uh, pandemic portfolio management. Um, yeah, so what we're going to talk about, I'm just going to introduce us quickly and what we do. And, um, basically, Rand Swiss, uh, which is the company that I'm representing, uh, we have partnerships with a, a lot of different people. And I think what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is also the, the, the requirement for partnerships uh, in the the, the very strange times that we find ourselves in. So with, uh, with that, I mean, yeah, what we basically do is uh, we do a variety, we do, do general financial services. So we do everything from online trading, advisory stock broking, we do managed portfolios as well, which I'll talk a little bit about our strategy today too. Um, then we do some structured products, which is medium risk. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Um, obviously, we do off offshore transfer, full wealth management, and then I promised in the blurb as well that I would reveal new tax-free savings pricing, um, which I hope is going to, I think it is the lowest in the market currently. So that will just be how we finish. Um, but before, yeah, so, so just to go through the, the format of what I want to talk about. Um, first, we're going to just review current market conditions. Where are we at the moment? Uh, what is happening in this very, very strange world that we find ourselves? Um, we're going to discuss, uh, you know, your investment strategy in a pandemic. What should you be doing? What shouldn't you be doing? Um, and then I'm going to give you some actionable ideas uh, on how to position your portfolio. And as I said, we're going to chat about TFSA pricing at the end. Um, okay, so current market conditions. Where are we? Uh, at the moment. So the markets are, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not going to talk too much on the, the coronavirus. Uh, we've got a little bit of a slide later on, but I want to just run through the, the basic economic numbers overseas, uh, overseas and locally as well. So if you have a look at this chart that I've, I've brought up here, this is essentially uh, the US unemployment rate. And uh, you know, what you, you might be missing there just on the, on the right hand side, that's, that's not actually the y axis, that's, that's the spike in unemployment ever. And one of the themes that I want to go through today as well is just that if you have a look at where that spiked to, so the, the, in April, the uh, US unemployment spiked to 14.7%. Um, and there's all sorts of different measures of, of, of US unemployment. Um, this essentially is the worst that we've seen, you know, probably in anyone that, that operates in markets at the moment's uh, memory. Um, you know, we're talking, you know, pre-World War II levels of unemployment. So, you know, this is far worse than the, the, the unemployment levels we, we achieved in the, the financial crisis. Um, you know, this is, this is worse than anything that we saw in dot, dot .com. Um, this, this is a, a, a severe shock to the U.S. economy. Um, I remember when the, the, the first uh, print came out. So, as I said, there's a, there's a whole lot of different... Um, you know, unemployment metrics that you can measure in the US, uh, everything from non from payrolls to ADP, but the, the one that I saw first was the uh, initial, uh, initial jobless claims. Um, now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has been uh, looking at initial jobless claims all the way back until 1967. So 1967, this, the, this, this unemployment is, uh, is NFP, so this goes a little bit further back. But in 1967 is essentially, so around here was when the, the U.S. Labor Department started measuring uh, uh, initial jobless claims. When we saw that, that, that first print, which is a weekly number rather than a monthly number like uh, non-farm payrolls, um, it was absolutely astounding. The, the worst we had ever seen on a weekly number was kind of between six and seven hundred thousand and, and I mean we were well into the millions at that stage um, and the markets were shocked I mean everyone was shocked the market started going up uh, automatically and we'll talk a bit about why in a bit but the fact is that and, and I think it's something that I really want to get across today is that we are sitting in a very very unique situation and there's a phrase in markets which says you know, this time it's different and it's kind of ironic because it's never different and it's always the same. But this time I want to say it really is different. So, and, you, and I'm, going to, I'm going to show you in, in figures now why, why I believe it is. Um, and there are times in, in markets, there are, you, know, we, we, you know, generally when you look at stock market history, people go back about 100 years. Um, maybe they, very seldom, I mean, people talk about the, the tulip bubbles, uh, you know, the, the Dutch, the tulip bubbles and that from, from kind of, uh, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. But, but really, I mean, most people will talk in, in, in almost one or two lifetimes, but that's not how humanity works. Um, you know, we can have, you know, fundamental changes to, to the way that the world operates. And I think we are, you know, the, the 20, you know, you know, 2020 could potentially be the start of that. I don't think um, the idea of this time it's different should be, should be approached with scorn, should I put it that way. So that's Next number. So another thing that uh, that's happened. So again, this is taking uh, U.S. interest rates. So I mean, this is something we've been dealing with. It shouldn't be new to anyone, but it's something that we've been dealing with for a long time. And you can see the difference. So this is just again, it's a, a much longer term chart of 
increase interest rates. Um, and you can see, obviously, they've been coming down over time, so since kind of the mid-1980s. Uh, the mid but what has changed now in the market, and what has changed significantly in the market, is the, uh, the fact that we're approaching what's called the zero-bound problem. So you can see that after the global financial crisis, what happened is essentially rates hit zero. And they hit the zero-bound problem is that you can't really take rates negative. Now, you've got some, you know, you've obviously got the situation where uh, you've got some uh, rates in, uh, in Europe trading negative. I mean, things can trade negative. There are reasons that they trade negative. I mean, you know, we had oil for the first time ever in the, in the history of oil markets. We had oil trading negative where people would actually pay you to take oil recently. So um, another very un, un, you know, unbelievable situation that, that would lead me to believe that the idea that this time it's different um, might, might not be so crazy after all. So look at, looking at that, you can see obviously interest rates flattened. We managed to just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, as we went through the kind of a taper tantrum uh, back then, and then we started to raise, raise rates again. Markets started to become accustomed to this, uh, but obviously with, with coronavirus sweeping through and the, the widespread lockdowns, we've obviously seen rates cut to almost zero, or you can basically cut to zero again. And once again, stimulus programs starting up in the US. But again, my, my point that I'm making on this number is that, that something very unusual is going on in the last, say, 10 10 years in markets. Um, this is okay, retail sales. So again, this is a 30-year retail sales chart. Uh, again, I'm sticking to US just to start with, and then I'll move across to South Africa. You can kind of see the, the, the scale of the impact of coronavirus here. The you know, global financial crisis, which is this, um, this little blip down here, it was minor. And I mean, that was the, the biggest shock to, to financial markets since, um, uh, you know, since the Great Depression, essentially, was called the Great Depression. Um, and what we have here is something that, that is happening on a magnitude that is far, far greater. Um, now, you might be wondering why did retail sales initially plummet and then, uh, and then recover as strongly as they have. Um, it's, it's, it's down to essentially stockpiling and, and that initial kind of reaction to, to lockdowns and, and actually, you know, just the collapsing of spending around uncertainty was replaced when things started opening up by, uh, you know, essentially stockpiling, re rebuying all the stuff that you haven't bought. Um, we saw obviously a very, very strong rebound there as well. But, um, but again, will this, you know, will necessarily this, um, this event that we're going through at the moment, this very strange year and the start of a new decade, will this uh, result in permanent changes to spending patterns? It's, it's very likely that it could. So that's just, again, it's just to highlight the impact of a 30-year chart of how dramatic the change in behavior has been for, for essentially society. Um, okay, so I'm going to flip, flip to, to uh, you know, South Africa. So we got this number yesterday, which was the South Africa consumer price inflation number at 2.1%. Now that, and obviously the, the first reaction from anyone should be, oh yes, that's pretty good. I'm really happy that um, you know, inflation is low. Isn't that what we're trying to do? Um, it's actually not, unfortunately, because you know, the Reserve Bank has an inflation targeting framework. So they're trying to keep inflation between 3 and 6%. So the fact that we've now fallen out of the bottom of that band, that is, that is unfortunate. That is going to result in a reaction from, from the, the central bank next week. So there's, uh, there's, you know, if you look at the estimates from the big banks and, and various economists, you probably are going to see another 75 basis points cut off um, the repo rate. So that's obviously going to feed into to interest rates. And uh, we can feel it in our client base already. You know, anyone that has uh, you know, more of a fixed income strategy, anyone that relies on you know, a lower risk option, so they, they can't just go into markets, they're not just here to go and buy stocks, they, they need to have, you know, they need to have that interest, that interest, you know, if you're a retiree, you just, it's not suitable for you just to be, you know, gung-ho or all in equity. Um, but with, with interest rates being cut as they have and, and now forecast to go down even further, um, that's putting enormous pressure on, um, on, on, on many people. Uh, at the same time, it's also making uh, South Africa a less attractive place, which is interesting because, um, you know, typically, you know, we get this question all the time. Why is the currency so strong at the moment? You know, look at, look at, look at what's happening on the ground. Look at our, you know, the various uh, metrics. That, uh, you look at, you know, just the, the, the level of destruction in business. If you, I don't, I don't have this chart up, but uh, the recent business confidence uh, 
um, uh, stats as well. Business confidence in South Africa, you know, plummeted basically, it was a couple of points off record lows, but if, you know, the way that business confidence works, it is, it's essentially a survey of, of three questions looking at uh, what you believe the, the economy will do over the next 12 months, um, what your, how your uh, particular household is faring, and what uh, and your view on durable goods uh, purchases, so buying things like washing machines and dishwashers, etc. Um, we we're talking just in the durable goods question, that was the worst number ever in South Africa. So people are pessimistic. Um, the, the number, I think, I think the number on that was negative 64. And the number can potentially be negative 100 as the worst or positive 100 on, on business confidence. So people are not confident about the future in South Africa. That is absolutely clear. Um, but what we, uh, what we have here is essentially inflation falling um, and the currency getting stronger. And that, that in everyone's minds is a very odd phenomenon. Um, the, the, the thing that has saved us so far is that while the Reserve Bank has cut interest rates fairly aggressively with the lockdowns to try and stimulate the economy, they've actually been slower than many of the central banks overseas. So what that's created is an environment where our bonds are actually fairly attractive. And it's also created an environment, so it's essentially created an environment where um, you know, because we're cutting slightly, slightly more slowly, we, we've almost been insulated. You remember, we went through obviously the rate, the sovereign ratings downgrade as well, uh, and I think uh, you know, if you look at Saab, they were probably trying to insulate us a little bit against that. So they've they've dropped rates a little bit slower than 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 they maybe could have, um, and that has helped to help to just you know stabilize the currency and and I think stabilize. Uh, uh, you know, they haven't they, they've been irresponsible in in my opinion, but. Um, but it's been it's been difficult. It's 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 resulted in a situation now where as they start to cut more aggressively to try and uh, you know stimulate a little bit of growth and actually stimulate a little bit of inflation, um, it's going to make South Africa a very unattractive destination going forward. Uh, you know, if we see our interest rates, and, and if our interest rates do come down by another 75 basis points, the the premium that that foreign investors were getting for holding South African bonds. Um, is starting to look less attractive. So if we were at 16.65 today on the currency, you know, like to the rand dollar, uh, on the rand dollar pair, uh, suddenly you look at that and you think, you know, if I'm only going to get, you know, let's say three and a half percent or four, maybe four percent, um, is that enough, given where the currency is trading currently, to shield me against the potential currency depreciation? Um, and the answer is probably not at this stage. The the, the real interest rate just isn't high enough. Um, what we've seen as a result is we've seen a huge amount of foreign outflow. So if you look at foreign outflows, um, foreign outflows reports also from the Reserve Bank, you'll see that there's been you know dramatic uh, uh, portfolio flows. So about 75% of it is bond outflows, but equity outflows have also been high. Um, that's going to punish things like our retail stocks. So remember, you know there was a, there was a point I think where clicks was over 70% foreign held. Um, you know, if if people are starting to move out because they're afraid of the the, the currency risk in South Africa as well, um, you are going to see more and more outflows as well. So um, it's an important thing to to consider. Just that our inflation is so low. Obviously, our inflation is not low. You get cost push and, and demand pull inflation. Our, our inflation is unfortunately not low for the right reasons, which is like technological advances. Um, our inflation is low because essentially our businesses are shutting down and, and consumers are losing jobs. And because consumers are losing jobs, they can't go and uh, buy the goods. So essentially what you get is you get firms then discounting their goods to try and move inventory. And um, I mean, it's, it's kind of in a weird way what uh, TFG did this week. Um, where they saw, uh, where at least, a, if not, not TFG, or at least what Edcon did this week, the, the business rescue practitioners, I mean, they were selling, they sold jet for, for 480 million rand, um, which had inventory of uh, of around 800 million rand, or that's part of the deal. So um, it's, yeah, it's something that is happening and it's uh, it's difficult. So this is the, the chart that I think no one wants to look at. It's actually painful to look at. Um, and that is uh, the, the South African unemployment rate. I mean, we can start to see the, the unemployment rate creeping up. Um, it's unfortunately this is also not not a chart that, that looks like it's going to turn any time soon. Um, we already, if you look at the Gini coefficient, we're one of the most unequal societies on the planet. Um, and unfortunately, given the the, the level of uh, I suppose business just this destruction of business that these lockdowns have caused. And, you know, you can blame it on poor government policy, you can blame it on many things, but, uh, you know, essentially this is, you know, this is, is a function of, of, of coronavirus. It's a, it's a very unfortunate event as well, but um, things could potentially get a lot worse here before they get better. Um, if you look at our GDP, 
growth rates, we are firmly in recession. So there's no, there's no, how can I say this? There's no sugar coating this. this uh, we are in a very, very bad spot at the moment. Um, you've got uh, two, two uh, so you know, te- whether they call it a technical recession or technically we're in recession. Um, but if you have two quarters of negative growth, that is essentially a recession. Um, we've had our two in our third quarter, and there, it looks like there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, imminent recovery either. So looking at the, you know, again, estimates from big bank economists, um, we are seeing the, um, they're, they're seeing only a potential recovery. And remember, when, when kind of sell-side economists look at, uh, uh, you know, when they plug it into their models and they look at GDP growth, they always have an optimistic slant as well. So there's, you know, it's, it's you know, we've, we've talked about it almost as a, um, a string that you're walking along like a tightrope. And as you get closer to their projections, their projections start to sag into where you're going. It seems to be how it, how it works. Um, but they're now probably the most pessimistic that I've ever seen in my life. Certainly. So they're saying that uh, you'll probably only see South African GDP recovering to pre, pre-2020 uh, 20 levels um, in 2026. So there doesn't seem to be any strong rebound. And, and as you see, so, so I'm just going to skip back quickly to the, uh, the unemployment uh, graph on the US. You can see the unemployment peak that the, here has peaked at uh, 17, uh, at least uh, 7, but it's already dropped to 11.1. Um, you're seeing a very quick recovery in U.S. markets at the moment. Now, the difference is, and I'm, I, I often pick it on, on the labor restrictions in South Africa as well. I think it's, it's one of the mistakes that we've made in policy is, is, the, is this, the very, very stringent uh, labor law and the, the heavy red tape that we have. Um, but essentially what happened in the U.S. is we got that spike. And, and what happened is as it spiked, it was shocking as of the spike in, on the way up. But it was also shocking on the, on the speed of the reversal. Now, uh, kind of like the way that we think it's one of the companies that we cover is Disney. Um, and having a look at Disney, we can see that, um, uh, yeah, having a look at Disney, we can see that uh, essentially what happened is as, as the U.S. went into lockdown, Disney essentially just retrenched everyone. They just followed, the, you know, all the parks. The parks are a big part of their business. They closed the parks. They just basically fired everyone. Um, they moved it, moved the responsibility for those people over to the government, which then you know obviously put in huge fiscal programs. There was this uh, essentially the stimulus checks that kept people going, and what that essentially did is it protected the company, uh, it protected Disney. So once you went through a temporary shock, as we had here, the company survived at the other side. And because the company survived, what happened is as uh, you know lockdowns eased, as people were allowed to go back to work and allowed to start spending again, um, the kind of government stimulus checks uh, tapered off and the businesses were still in good enough health to then hire the people back. And you suddenly got a huge uptake in US, uh, in US employment again, far more than people expected. So um, in South Africa, I don't, we're, we're not in the same uh, situation just because uh, the way that it works, one, we, we haven't been, a, you know, people, People haven't in the past been able to essentially labor, labor law is very, very restrictive, but also a lot of the burden of the, 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 the virus and, and, the, and the lockdowns have been shifted onto business owners. And because it's been shifted onto business owners, those businesses are not going to be able to bounce back as capital is destroyed. So uh, South Africa, we're in a very different position to the US, um, very, very negative position. And I'm, if, if anyone who knows me knows that I'm generally an eternal optimist but there are there are certain things that i just i cannot i cannot sit here and say oh, it's all going to be fine when when honestly looking at the numbers and looking at the, the projected recovery in gdp we are going to be going through a very very difficult time locally for a long time now um okay now hopefully it'll get a bit more optimistic and so this is essentially, okay, so I've just, I said, I'm not going to talk too much around the coronavirus, but um, this is essentially just a dashboard. I think everyone knows these numbers. Anyone that uh, Google has, has been tracking these numbers closely, um, you know, we're looking at the John Hopkins University dashboard. I, I kind of like the dashboard just because uh, a nice map it shows you where the the big the big infection areas are uh, we can see the us is still absolutely overwhelmed i don't know they they're going for a i suppose a herd immunity strategy at, at this stage and, and i'm just hoping that the, the vaccines either from moderna or we've heard from so many companies from moderna to gilead sciences with their um to 
do Johnson & Johnson, to, you know, every company seems to be making headway day by day, but uh, the problem is that the reality of the situation is that we are still a long way from uh, having a reliable vaccine. And even though we are now, you know, a good couple of months into, into this uh, pandemic, um, the actual information that we have about the virus is still very limited. So, uh, as I said, daily, daily, uh, daily uh, global death rate is still increasing. Um, we are not through the, the, the peak, in my opinion, yet. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think, you know, and while we might see an end to the disruption as, uh, as people learn to live with the virus and, and the lockdowns become less, um, uh, you know, as the lockdowns become less, uh, less strict, um, in, in some developed countries, obviously, we, we've now gone to level three plus, which is uh, it kind of looks a lot like level four, but uh, at least we still have some some freedoms. Um, things things are difficult. Things are going to things are going to remain difficult. So um, yeah, I think yeah, it's it's something that we're not. We, in my opinion, we're not through the worst yet. Um, although from an economic point of view, if people if people open up economies um, and we don't see a return to heavy lockdowns, um, we might still see in some of the developed economies the worst being behind us in terms of financial market pricing. So where are we now? Um, we, 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 what now? Where does that leave us? So coronavirus, we've got very, very bad economic numbers, and we've got literally markets in the US and many markets internationally, and even the JSE, doing very, very well. So we have uh, financial markets seeming to price in much better news than potentially we're getting uh, from the economic data. Um, now, that's one of the reasons that, uh, that many people will give, um, is that there's been just such an enormous level of central bank stimulus. Um, you know, I watched the, the which was the uh, FOMC recently, uh, where John Powell was basically testi not testifying, but going through the Q and A afterwards. Um, which was the one where he said, "We are not even thinking about thinking about raising rates in the U.S." So what the Fed does is Fed essentially gives us a dot plot, um, and that dot plot gives us uh, a view on where potentially uh, U.S. interest rates might lift off that that zero level that we're seeing at the moment. Um, there was one dissenting voice in 2022 that said that interest rates might, might lift. So we've got to, and remember, the Reserve Bank is always going to be very linked to what happens to global central banks. Global central banks you know, these days, because of globalization, they move almost in tandem. So um, if the Fed is going to keep the interest rates low, interest rates in South Africa are going to remain low as well. Um, so what does that mean? In South Africa, in the past, what it has meant, so, so essentially what we've got now is Q programs, so the, the printing of money, the, 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 the increasing of uh, the, the swelling of the Fed balance sheet, um, has in the past been very, very good for emerging markets. So essentially what you've got is a, um, you know, I've just given you kind of what happened uh, last time around. So we had a couple of different QE programs, and, and each time we actually saw the South African markets as a beneficiary of those QE programs. So when, when you get this huge, very, very um, dovish central banks and, and you see a lot of stimulus flowing into the financial system, um, what happens is uh, you do see money starting to go uh, on, the, on the hunt for yield. So you start to see money moving away from developed markets and into emerging markets. And the reason for that is obviously it's the same as what we were talking about earlier. Interest rates are, if interest rates in the US are a lot lower, what happens is you get uh, a situation where uh, people can't necessarily find options um, to get the yield they require either in their retirement portfolios or, or, or whatever, whatever the, the mandate is that they're managing to, they, they need to go and look for a slightly higher return and they end up moving towards emerging markets. Um, it's one of the reasons that in, in the global financial crisis, we saw stocks like British American Tobacco, or um, at that stage it was SAB listed, um, doing very well. They were big dividend paying stocks. They were seen as very, very stable companies. And because the company was seen as so stable, it was almost seen like a quasi bond that still gave you a coupon because obviously, uh, bond yields had, had dropped so dramatically um, because of this very expansionary uh, uh, monetary action from, from the central banks. Um, and what you had is those, those kind of very defensive mega cap companies started to rise, um, especially if they gave you some sort of dividend yield as well. 
um, and what we had in the South African context, we actually had a couple of very, very decent years, even though our economy wasn't necessarily tracking the same thing. I mean, every, you know, you, you obviously understand that the South African market is very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very manic market in, in that it's, uh, it's got the South African ink companies, which generally trade on very low PEs. Um, they don't attract the kind of multiples that the, uh, that the, the, the international companies do. And then kind of the, the offshore dual listed RAND hedge kind of companies like Process and um, some of the mining stocks like Billet and, and uh, Anglo-American and, um, you know, even Richmond, for example, is a, is a good dual listed example, uh, which is also listed on the Swiss exchange. Um, now, those companies are obviously attracting a much higher PE than the, the South African companies, but overall, um, in a period of monetary policy, our general index was lifting uh, over that period. Um, now, you know, well, they say past performance is not an indication of future performance. And I think what you've also got to just be careful of is that this time it really could be different as well. Uh, it could be different in South Africa. It could be different in uh, global context. And just be understood in that situation that there was yield and, and that South Africa was a very attractive destination and a beneficiary of that, it might not be. Oh. So this is just a, a quick chart of the GDP in South Africa by decade. Um, and it just gives you a sense of, of and again, it comes up on that things do change in financial markets. The idea that you can just buy something and forget about it and be like, ah, I bought the market. That's cool. It's going to go up because I've invested in shares and shares always go up. And that's, that's a good idea. Um, it's not valid, in my opinion. Um, if you look at what happened in the 60s, the 1960s, you saw, a, you, I mean, you go and look at the, the, the real returns, they're significantly higher than what, what's been happening later, later on. Uh, in 2000 to 2000 to 2010, we went through a very, very good period. Um, you know, it, uh, and, and I mean, we had, we had a decent return there. Um, you know, the last 10 years, we've had pretty much our lowest return ever. And now it comes to your decision on what will the next 10 years for South Africa hold? Where will that, is it just going to kind of be more of the same? Like as so many financial planners, and, you know, financial professionals uh, believe, they, they kind of look at their, they, they look at their, their fact sheets, and they go look at the historic performance and they say that that is something that we can trust um, because, but they, they don't necessarily look back far enough and they're not taking into, into consideration the real tail risks of, of what could happen. And I think that's, you know, that is why I just, like my, my main message here is, is we are in very, very uncharted territory. Um, be careful. Um, if you're going to do something, uh, if you're going to go it alone, um, this maybe is not the time for you to do it. Okay. I'm just going to have a look here at uh, some relative rotation graphs. Okay, so this is something a, a little bit different. So this is, um, okay, so this is just to give you an idea again of where markets are currently. Um, so this was actually, these graphs were created by Julius uh, de Kempenau, um, who was a sell-side analyst, and he was actually looking at, at the relative asset management and how you could uh, look at things. So essentially what he did is he's got, uh, you know, the momentum indicator on the left-hand side, what's called the ratio on the bottom. And it essentially puts, and you can put anything on these charts, and I've got three charts for you now. Um, and I'm sure Simon will circulate the presentation afterwards so you can really go and dig into what, what each of these mean. Um, but essentially, these are, these are all monthly charts. And essentially, what they're looking at is the last seven months and how a stock has been moving between the momentum and the ratio. Now, what, what the way that you read this, in, in historically, what you would do is you would go and look in the top left-hand quadrant and you'd say anything in the top left-hand quadrant, that is something that we should be buying. It's got essentially good momentum in it, um, but its ratio is negative. So it's, a, it's essentially, it's a sector that has fallen and it's a sector that is, is starting to gain momentum in a recovery. Um, you know, I actually, we put, I put a chart out on Twitter and it was quite cool because the RRG researchers is the people that created these charts and they actually got hold of me and we ended up having a whole debate around, uh, you know, should you be buying in the top left quadrant or what, what, what is the latest work around these charts and how they work? Uh, and they actually came, came out with uh, something that said it's actually the heading. So what happens on this, these charts, and like I said, I put, I put um, this is basically uh, S&P, uh, this is uh, MSCI World versus all the different markets. So essentially what we're doing here is we're hunting for markets that are interesting, so potential regions that could give you uh, interesting returns going forward. Um, now, if you have a look at, uh, yeah, if you have a look at it, what they've said to us is that essentially it's also about the heading. 
So it's like if you think of like a compass and you think of like which, which um, like the, the degrees of a compass, if it's heading between 0 and 90 degrees on a compass, uh, as in if it's heading up and to the right, if you're looking at the screen, um, that is actually a, 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 like a signal that this market or this instrument or this uh, whatever is going to generate our performance. So what we've got here, interestingly, is we've got the topics um, and we've got the cost piece. So we've got kind of Asian markets looking, uh, looking like they could uh, do fairly well. Um, like obviously if you have to go and pull this out as well like i also wanted to see where the local exchange was so this is the local exchange running here so it's in it's in the uh, it's in the lagging quadrant currently but what happens is this essentially always rotates the like the security should rotate anti-clockwise um you know all things being equal um, and what we've got now is we've got obviously you know it's 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 got a negative ratio and negative momentum so it's in the lagging quadrant but essentially what's happening is we are seeing the jse starting to turn which could actually be an optimistic sign for the JSE going forward. If we can see over the next couple of months, so like I said, this is a seven month graph, if you can see the JSE start to head on that heading up, up and to the right, uh, it could be a signal that the JSE has maybe bottomed in terms of value, and there could be a rotation out of some of the more expensive markets into a, a market like the JSE, um, if everything was equal and, and there wasn't uh, fundamental problems. Um, so I've just given you, okay, so this is a, now a, another one just to give you, uh, sorry, just give me a, so, okay, so this is now uh, how you use this in, in terms of sector rotation inside a market. Um, now what we've got here is this is the, essentially the, the JSC uh, All Share Index. I've just broken it down into its different sectors. So you can see what sectors are going to do well, what sectors are going to do badly. And based on this kind of theory, and I mean, it's, it's really good if you, you guys can read up on this theory afterwards, it's called relative rotation graphs. Um, you'll see currently healthcare is actually the one sector that's on the right heading in the right quadrant and could potentially be um, a sector that actually generates out performance compared to the other sectors within this index because this is all benchmarked against the JSE. Um, Tech has also done well, so I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be very heavy in the likes of MassPass Process, um, which is pretty much our, our big tech company. Um, you know, when it's moving like that, which is base materials, uh, you're not going to, at least basic materials, you're not going to see too much. Uh, and you can see the rest. So financials in the lagging qu uh, quarter, not looking good. Heading in the wrong direction, also not good, doing, doing good. Um, telecoms, also not, not, not particularly great. Um, industrials, also suffering. So interesting graph but it looks like the sectors that that could potentially do well are, are taken healthcare at the moment um, and then i've done the same thing for the s p 500 um, i'm going to have to give you a little bit of a key on this one so i actually had to drop energy off it just so that you could see what these uh, what these underlying indices were um, but essentially what we had we had energy right down at the bottom so energy has been absolutely us um, this sp45 and you can google these codes as well and it will come up um, SP45 is the tech index. So you can see it's, it's so the, these graphs, if you look at a lot of them, they all look kind of like tornadoes. And what you've got at the moment is you've got tech just so far out ahead, it's unbelievable. Okay, heading in the right direction, but also in the leading quadrant. So it's almost like the, the, way, that, um, the way that RNG explains it is, um, if you're in the, the left-hand quadrant over here and you're heading uh, up and to the right, so if you're heading on that between that north and 90 degree direction, you're you're in uh, or if you at least on the left half of the screen even um, it's a high risk bet uh, but it should return good it should create good returns for you if it's on the right hand side and it's in the right direction it's a lower risk bet and it should create good returns for you now of course this is all technical analysis so um, you know take it uh, with a pinch of salt take it through from where it comes but it is yeah so that's kind of the tech index the other one that uh, is the sp30 which is um, that is the consumer staples index. So that'll be things like Procter and Gamble, um, you know, and the, and the more um, the consumer staple focused businesses also looking pretty good. Um, the 20, that would be the industrial sector looking pretty poor. Um, the uh, SP, yeah, and then you've got SP15 over there, which is the also the material sector also suffering a little, a little bit. Um, SP25 is something that you could maybe be seeing an early turn on, and that's consumer, consumer discretion. Maybe we'll see that pick up. We spend them. So that is kind of the basic overview of where we see markets, where we see sectors at the moment, and, and a little bit around it. So now I just want to talk quickly about, uh, yeah, so we've got a little bit to get through. So I just want to talk quickly about uh, your investment strategy. So how are you guys positioning uh, in a pandemic like this? But as, I, as I've been mentioning to you, you get 
situations, you get markets that are normal. And when I say normal, markets are never normal, but you get markets that are, are behaving predictably and do and behave predictably for a while. A great example of this was 2017. It was like it was the first time to be a stockbroker. It was literally every day would come in and the market would be like half a percent higher. And it was this, it was great to be an investor, but it was terrible if you made your living off, uh, off volatility. So essentially every day the, the, the market would just get like a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And it was heading all in the same direction. It was very, a very stable period, in, in, especially in offshore markets. Um, and everyone was kind of heading in the right direction. And what happened is you know, it became very obvious. You buy an ETF. You get behind that ETF. Um, you just go and buy like an S and P 500 tracker, or, or you know, and, and you sit there and you just and you just plot along like you're in traffic. And everyone kind of does, and everyone kind of makes money, and it's good. You know, it's it's one of those well beaten paths. Now the problem is when things start to get hairy, when things start to change, um, that sort of strategy won't work for you anymore. You can't just kind of follow the momentum anymore. You need to have a better understanding. And, and as I said, so when you start going, think about it, like if you're on a highway, if you're on the highway to Cape Town and you're just driving down the, the N1, um, you don't need a map. You don't need a guide. You know, you stick on the N1, you're going to get to Cape Town. No problem. The problem comes is when you start to take detours, when you start going, you know, into and, and more uncharted territory. And when you start end up going on the real back roads and you have no map and you have no guide, this is when you start to run into real problems. Um, and that kind of analogy is what, what I'm gonna kind of run through with the, the types of picks that I've, I've given uh, this. So just to give you an idea, and I, like I'm, I am pro ETF, so don't get me wrong, but I just thought this would be interesting info for you guys as well. Um, Everyone loves passive and, every, and ETFs, are, but, but ECF investing is becoming more tricky. Uh, so if you have a look at it, this is basically just, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a quick performance summary in, in US dollars and in uh, RAND of uh, all the ETFs listed on our exchange. So what you've got uh, on the left-hand side is the top-up ETFs, and you see that the best performing on our exchange at the moment are actually the commodity ETFs. So you've got things like Rhodium, uh, New Gold, um, uh, you've got, uh, yeah, basically anything to do with uh, gold, gold and precious metals has done very well. Anything offshore has done well. NASDAQ, S&P 500, Palladium, all done exceptionally well. Huge returns both in dollars and in, uh, and in rand. Um, on the other hand, you've got, you know, what, what looks like a, a proper um, collapse uh, in um, uh, a proper collapse in uh, in SA property. So anything that was heavily invested directly in South Africa has done exceptionally poorly. Um, and these are year-to-day performance graphs. So you're talking about this, the worst performing ETF on our market is down 60.75% in dollars. Um, it's down almost 50% um, uh, in, in RAND, in RAND terms. Uh, much of this is because of, uh, you know, just concern around uh, the protection of property rights, the, the whole idea of uh, land redistribution has got investors very nervous, but also the world is changing from a technology point of view. Um, you know, if anything, the coronavirus has taught us that we can Zoom and we don't need to be sitting in buildings. You know, I'm sitting in a very dark JSE building at the moment, which I think I'm going to turn on the light for. But essentially, uh, what, is, uh, what is happening uh, around the world Sorry, that would be a bit better. Um, but it's what is happening around the world is essentially that um, that, that that whole industries are changing and, and markets themselves are changing. So you can't just uh, assume that everything is going to be uh, the same forever and that you can just go and buy anything and it will do well. Um, you need to be a little bit more specific than that. Um, okay, so who, where, when, when do you need someone? When don't you need someone? Is kind of the question that I want to answer. As we basically look at it in terms of three types of service. So you've got um, an inter the intermediary uh, service account, you've got uh, a discretionary account, and you've got an advisory, an advisory account. Now, who, who would buy what type of product, if you want to put it that way? Um, if you both, okay, so the, the important concepts that I want to get across is if you understand your risk and you understand the instruments that you're investing in, as in you both understand that you should be in equities or fixed income, or you understand the level of risk that you can adopt as a person, and on top of understanding that well and accurately, 
you understand the products that you're investing in. So you understand if you're going to go and buy that derivative, you understand how that derivative works, you understand what the counterparty risk on the derivative is, you understand how the margining works on the derivative. If you're going and buying a company, you understand the management team, you understand at least who the management team is, you understand um, the basic uh, products and, 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 and services inside that company. You understand what, you know, you essentially understand how the business works. You at least understand how to read financial statements. If you understand that, then you should have an online trading account. Then you you should be trading on your own. You should be doing these things for yourself. Um, if you're going to manage proper money, uh, when I say you're going to manage the, the bulk of your money, not, you know, I'm, I'm all for an online trading account if you're going to put a little bit of money on the side and have a bit of fun and go and buy some companies that you like. That's a, a totally different uh, aspect of investing. But if you're a serious investor that's trying to generate real wealth for yourself, um, you need to understand those two things if you're going to do it yourself. If you don't understand those two things, you need to basically diversify some of your risk away. If you understand your risk, but you don't understand the instruments that you're necessarily investing in, then it's, then essentially you should probably be using some sort of uh, asset manager. You know, many products and, and ET, and when I say AS manager, it doesn't necessarily have to be an active person. I mean, I'm all for robo advice and technology. It can be a passive ETF, um, but it, you know, it must be regulated in the right place and you must understand um, essentially what type of products that are being invested in it, but you must understand essentially the risk level. And most of those you'll find on a fact sheet of a fund. If the fund says high risk and you understand that you can adopt high risk, you can buy the fund. That is, that is the idea behind uh, discretionary management. And if you understand those two things, that's where you, you can go and select your own funds. You can go and select your own ETFs. No problem. Totally happy. Finally, when do you need advisory service? And, and this is kind of a, a more of a wealth management uh, service. If you don't understand your risk and you don't understand the instrument. So if you have no clue on whether you should be in a fixed income investment or a market investment, or you don't even know that there are medium risk investments in between, and you don't understand what your risk profile is, you need to sit with a financial advisor. It doesn't mean that you can't go play the market. I'm totally happy for you to play the market with a little bit of your cash, but um, you, do, you do need to speak to someone. And, and I mean, this is, this is strange coming from me because I've always very much been, I mean, I've got a very heavy stockbroking background. So I've always said, ah, people should always do everything themselves. Why would you ever pay anyone else to do anything for you when you can cut your costs down to nothing? Um, I do appreciate that. But, but having seen, you know, having worked on the stockbroking desk for 10 years now, or for more than 10, just almost 15 years now, um, I have seen that, you know, other than professional investors, if you're not sure of what you're doing, I've seen people try and avoid a 1% management fee only to dump 50% of their portfolio by making bad decisions. Um, it's heartbreaking to watch. And it's something that I, I, I really, I really dislike having to do and having to, having to see. So um, if you want some, some real advice from me, I would say the best thing that you can do in markets as difficult and challenging as, as we're in at the moment is speak to a professional. Again, it comes down to those networks. Get in touch with someone that you trust, someone that you know it, 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 really, is, it really is important. Okay, so how do you choose someone? So this is a little bit of a pun for us, I'll be honest. So you can use these three ways. You can just go with the overall best broker, which is us. You could go with what clients like, and uh, this is based on the IntelliDex um, uh, stockbroking awards. Um, if you look at uh, you know the client choices, so that's essentially what a client base would tell you to go with. Again, I think you can trust them. Uh, Rance was we happen to be number one there. Um, if you're looking for a heavy advice-based broker, these are some other options. If you don't like the product, you're welcome to try some of the other ones. But this will give you an idea if you if you don't like uh, Rand Swiss, um, it will give you an idea of some of the other brokers that are available and where their strengths are, whether they're either kind of advice-based brokers or where they kind of stack up uh, compared to everyone else. Um, and as I said, it is a bit of a pun for us, but uh, uh, you know, why should you listen to us and why, why is advice important? Um, it's, uh, you know, we are currently ranked the number one stockbroker, the best advice broker, and uh, hold the People's Choice Award presented by our clients. Like, okay, now that I've had my, my point, let's uh, have a look at three actionable ideas that we can, uh, that we can go through. Um, okay, I've, I'm trying to give you one low risk idea, one medium risk idea, and one high risk idea as well. So uh, the first idea is, uh, is gold. Um, and it's, I'm going to get lynched by all the professional asset managers out there saying, Gary, how can you possibly want to be buying gold at these levels? Uh, but I think that there's a very good argument to be made. 
<clears throat> if you look at gold, uh, the one reason that people don't buy gold is because uh, gold doesn't come with an interest rate. If you, if you have no interest rate, it, there's, there's an opportunity cost for, from holding gold rather than holding a currency that will pay you an interest rate. Um, when interest rates collapse as they have, gold becomes a more attractive asset. You can think about it, what is a fiat currency? A fiat currency is just a currency um, that has a central bank protecting its value and you get compensated for holding that currency by interest. Um, gold has no central bank. Gold's central bank is essentially the scarcity of the, the metal. Um, you know, gold, there's an argument to be made that it's a commodity, but I'm talking specifically about gold being used as cash. Um, why else do I like gold? I, as I mentioned earlier on, I think at 1660, we are incredibly strong on the currency. Gold is also a RAND hedge. If we see the RAND blowing out from here, gold will protect you over time. Um, a weakening currency is going to mean higher RAND gold price. It might not necessarily mean that the, the gold is getting more valuable, but if the RAND depreciates, this will protect you from a weakening, uh, a weakening currency. And finally, there's, uh, there's two things, and I've always found this interesting. So this is just a little chart, and, and we've seen a big drop off in demand. So this is a chart of uh, uh, basically it's the, the gold, gold buying in Asia. Um, and various different countries. And then we have got a second one here, which is basically the CNN fear and greed index, which is weirdly it's in greed at the moment. I would have thought there was more fear in the market at this stage. And it got down to kind of one around, uh, around April. But essentially what, how this affects gold is um, when you have rising prices, when you have rising Asian income levels, um, gold becomes more attractive. At the same time, when you have four, when you have fear in the West, so when you, you have that um, kind of market panic, you see Westerners moving towards gold. And that's kind of the, like, I suppose the, the geographic dichotomy between how gold moves. Now, um, what we've got now is a little bit of greed. So if I think if we go through and, and if we do see kind of the second wave of coronavirus coming through, you could easily see fear spiking again in the West and that will be good for gold. At the same time, you looked at those relative rotation graphs. Uh, if you look at many of the fundamentals of the Asian economies as well, um, they are in a strong position and it's becoming one of the preferred uh, geographic territories of asset managers currently. If we do start to see rising incomes in, in Asia again, and if, especially if we see uh, you, you know India really coming to the for, um, you're going to see a huge demand for gold as well, um, which is essentially a sentiment-driven metal because it has, no industri well, it has very limited industrial applications. Um, you could potentially see gold rising quite significantly. Um, so I am a gold bull. How would I buy gold? Um, so gold, essentially, there's a couple of different ways. I know we're running short time, so I'm going to be um, you can buy Krugerrands on the exchange, which I kind of like Krugerrands because it's, it's an investment that you can actually see and touch and feel. And I like that about it. Um, now, what you can do is there's actually been, they've actually, you know, there's a huge shortage of gold at the moment, which is making the market very, very interesting to watch. Um, Right now, because of the lockdown level three, um, we've got uh, you know, a backlog in production of crude rents. So if you go to any numismatics dealer, you will not be able to buy crude rents. I think, well, they'll let you buy it. They'll hedge the price probably with a derivative contract. Um, and you'll only get delivery in like two, three months time uh, when, when bullion production comes, uh, uh, rises again. Um, you're also seeing a skew. So you can actually buy crude rents on the exchange. Uh, you can buy crude rents, halves, quarters, and tenths. So I've given you the tickers on the right-hand side over here. Um, if you type that into a, a trading system, that should actually allow you to buy physical coins. If you buy them with us, essentially the coins get delivered on a, on a Tuesday um, and you can come and collect them. Uh, we can also arrange delivery if you want, but uh, essentially it is, it is available. Now, I kind of phoned a numismatics dealer today just to get you a double on their pricing. So they're pricing between 30,000 and um, uh, 30,500. Uh, they will buy coins from you. 32,500, they'll sell coins to you. And you can see on the exchange right now, because we've got this bullion shortage, there's a skew towards the, the, the ask prices. So we actually had a trade go through today, which I worked out that's, that's the currency, that's the level it should have gone through at. Um, it went through a 32,800 Rand for four coins who traded today. And there are only two coins on the offer currently. That double is normally a lot thicker when there's, there's you know, bullion production. But we have 80 coins on, on the bid at the moment. So if you were selling Kruger Rands here, which I still think that it's the places to buy Kruger Rands, but if you were selling, you would do significantly, you would do 1,500 Rand better to sell coins um, on the exchange, then you would have to have gone and sold it at, 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 a, at a coin shop, essentially. The other thing I've just put across around here, please don't fall for like going and buying Kruger and proofs. They're generally like 10, 15 grand more expensive than the bullion. Um, what you're looking for is intrinsic value. As soon as someone comes to you with... Uh, 
uh, the idea that this is a proof that there's people that are going to buy it. It's even this is an illiquid market. Um, you'll always actually find buyers at the moment, but uh, not always sellers. But um, you've always got the reserve bank standing, standing uh, good on the bullion coins anyway. But the, the proofs come at a, a significant premium. Um, and for me, it's just the idea that you can go and buy a rare five grand coin and people go and sell them for a hundred thousand rand. It's a scam. Like, yeah, you know, we've had we've had people approach us, uh, clients that have approached us and said, "Oh, but we we bought these coins. Can you help us?" And like, if you bought a five grand coin for five hundred thousand rand, unfortunately, that's only worth five grand. It's you know, so just be careful of that. Buy the underlying bullion. When you buy a coin, work out, take the dollar price times the rand at that stage and work out kind of roughly where your fair value is. There is about a 5% premium on Kruger Rand. So um, if you add 5% to that, you'll find uh, you'll, you'll be exactly in the Okay, so that's the first one. I'm going to run through the rest of the stuff pretty quick because I'm sure Simon's going to want to run. Oh, I know how strict he is. Um, but yeah, okay, so on the, the gold via an ETF, this is another way of holding it. So if you don't want to have to hassle with the storage of coins, if you don't want to actually have to hassle with dealing with physical bullion yourself, um, you've got the new gold, the ABSA new gold ETF, which is a great, great product. Um, I created this right from, right from when I was first in the market. Um, we, yeah, if you have a look at it, it's essentially 100% back, gold backed paper by ABSA. Um, it's uh, it's actually a little bit more volatile uh, than, than I thought, but it depends again what you're measuring it by. Is that RAND volatility or is that gold volatility? It's a good question. Um, it's pretty reasonably priced. So the the, um, uh, the fee for holding it, they are obviously going to charge you a fee for supplying you the paper and that, um, which you're not going to have if you're holding the physical bullion, but you get a lot for that. You don't have to store it. You don't have to, you know, it can sit in a stockbroking account and you can just watch it. You don't have to take physical delivery, um, but they charge you uh, uh, 30 basis points, so 0.3% per year to, to hold the ABSA new gold ETF. Um, the performance has actually not been bad. So I've put a little performance uh, graph. So if you look at it, so this, this was launched in 2004, November of 2004. Um, you can see for the full period, the average is 16.85% uh, return in Rand um, over five years, you've actually got a 16.75% return on, on the new gold ETF. Now, the reason for that is not because gold is as good as a company and gold is going to go manufacture things. It doesn't. It's not a company. It's it's cash. This is a low risk option, if you want to put it that way. Um, it's um, but it still has done pretty well in Rand terms. Um, yeah, so it's uh, and obviously that's because it holds its value and the currency has blown out completely. Second, uh, second product that I want to go through, this is a really simple product. Uh, it's one that we're running um, at the moment, which is basically it's an S&P 500 um, structured note. Um, it's really simple to understand. Minimum investment is 10,000 Rand. It's a five-year term. And all it gives you is it says it gives you the S&P 500. So it gives you a, I'll start give you the tracker. It's basically a linear return on the S&P 500, but you get an extra 5% on, on your return. So if, if the S&P over five years goes up 100%, you're going to get 105% back on your, on your contract. Um, obviously, with all structured products, you don't get dividends. So we think that 5% is going to compensate you for any dividends that you received. Um, at the same time, we also have a view that uh, companies are going to go through a very difficult time, US companies especially, um, and you are going to see dividends cuts. The dividend yield on the US markets is actually fairly low because they do normally favor share buybacks over, over dividend payments. Um, so we think that, that that should compensate you for the loss of the dividend. But what you get in return for doing this as a locked-in five-year product is you manage to get a 30% downside protection, which is what this, the orange chart here is your enhanced return. So if the market after five years is down 20%, you get all your money back. If you held an S&P 500 ETF, of course, if the market is down 20%, you're going to be down 20% as well. Um, the cap is at 30% down. If you're down 31% over five years, it's obviously going to revert back and will be as if you had bought the market. But it gives you some downside protection while giving you essentially market-linked upside protection. Um, that whole idea for me, uh, we're going to close this on the 20th of August, but the idea for me there is if you have central banks and markets, a lot of people are very scared that they're going to miss out on the, the, the returns on the S&P 500 index. At the same time, you're looking at indexes trading on a 23 PE. Historically, it can trade as high as a 28 PE, but if you, it, is, it is expensive given historic terms. So giving you a little bit of capital protection on the downside so that if things go wrong, um, you, you might be, you probably will get out of trouble and not necessarily take it. 
around. That's the idea behind the product. I think it's very attractive. Um, yeah, it's, it's backed by, uh, by an A-rated bank. Uh, it looks like it's going to be BMP Paribas back in the moat, um, but I really like it. I, I think it's a, an interesting option versus just going and buying uh, directly into a very expensive market at this stage. Um, and then finally, I would say managed portfolio. So I know you guys are going to lambaste me about stock picks, but um, this is kind of our managed portfolio. And I'll tell you a little bit about our strategy because I've got five minutes left. Um, essentially, what we're doing here is uh, we buy a basket of, of offshore companies. Um, we're holding, I think, 26 companies at the moment. Um, and it's basically big blue chip equity businesses. Um, we, the way that we select the companies is we, again, it comes back to networks. So it comes down to having the right network and, the, and knowing the right, the right research and the right people to listen to. When we, we have a way of essentially ranking uh, analysts on these companies. So if we're going and looking at something like Apple, for example, which we don't hold, um, we can go and see the analysts that have had the best calls. We can see the analysts with the best rankings and we can gain their research and we can leverage off the people that are the smartest on that product. What that strategy has done for us in the past is it's allowed and many people, so it's a, it's a wonderful quote. Uh, so I've been reading Peter Thiel's uh, uh, Not, Not to, uh, Zero to One book recently. And, and one of the questions he always asks new people when they're starting businesses, what, what, um, I think it's what unconventional truth what unconventional truth do you know that few other people believe? And for me in this portfolio is that analysts actually have a skew in their favor. So many people do not believe that analysts uh, can predict the markets. They, they think that analysts are always behind the curve. The fact is if you, if you you know the right analysts to look for and you have the right networks and the right people, you can get the right information to make the right decisions at the right time. What that's done for us, and this is essentially our, our move through COVID as we, as we had that strategy, we listened to the right people. Um, we, the red is essentially our portfolio. Um, we significantly outperformed on the downside when the markets were falling. Um, then obviously deploying cash lower down as well. We've significantly performed on the upside. Um, what does that mean? So what we essentially did is we were heavier in technology because we like technology. The, the MSCI world, which is the benchmark for this, is at about 21%. Uh, we're still at 22%, but we were heavier than that. So what we've done recently, um, so essentially we went through it. We like the technology companies. We've gone through a whole recovery in technology, um, the technology sector that, that's happened. But we saw that the banks were particularly hard hit. And we have been accumulating in the financial sector. That's pushed up our financial sector exposure. 25% uh, is not necessarily as high as it is because I'll show you that in, in the next slide. Um, but essentially what that's done is we've actually outperformed, which is the red thing, on the way up as well. So we outperformed on the way down and we outperformed on the way up. We then started trimming our financial, our technology exposure. So we've halved positions in Amazon, NVIDIA, uh, Home Depot, and Microsoft. Um, all of those positions have been halved. Uh, part of it was that just you know, regular portfolio management kind of trimming positions that had grown too much, but also because we are we are happier to be equal equal weight um, overseas technology companies at the moment. That's led to a little bit of our underperformance as we sit very, very heavy in cash at the moment. So we are sitting on about 20% cash in this portfolio, which is exceptionally heavy for us. Um, and we will we are redeploying at the moment. Um, it's kind of frictional cash more than, uh, you know, essentially bearish bet on the markets, um, but it has pushed up our technology exposure. So just to give you a basic rundown of where we sit on the portfolio and, and maybe why this kind of strategy that I'm talking about, why I believe it works and why it's something that you should um, you know, since inception, this is all, all in dollars. Uh, since inception, we've done 68%, uh, just over 68% in dollars. This is up to the 30th of um, uh, this year. Um, yeah, that's it's over just, just, uh, just over four years that we've been running the portfolio. We've done 68% in dollars versus our benchmark, which is the MSCI world, which has done 33.81% in dollars. Um, if you look at what's happened over this year, we're up 2%, but over one year, we're up 13.22% in dollars versus the, the MSCI world up 3.4% in dollars. So we've significantly outperformed. If you add, obviously, the RAND depreciation on top of that over the year, I think we're up, it's well over 30% in RAND. Um, happy to send you guys fact sheets if you're interested in more interested in this. We also have, uh, you know, decent monthly drawdowns uh, compared to, to our benchmark, and overall, the fund has worked very well. So you got to say, where are my stock picks, Gary? We come and watch Power Hour because we want our stock picks don't hold back on us. So like I said, we've been buying financials. The one financial that we really like at the moment is Citibank uh, through Citigroup. Um, we've already seen, J so we hold JP Morgan as well. JP Morgan has... Uh, 
uh, just released results, a huge beat. I think with the stimulus in the US, and I think I think people are underestimating how well these banks are going to do, one with their trading desks and the volatility, but what we saw in JP Morgan's earnings recently as well is that um, the... Uh, the underlying deposit business and the uh, and the uh, M&A businesses are also actually doing very well over this period. So I think people have priced the banks for the worst with the fall in interest rates, but this is not necessarily the case. So we are overweight financials. Um, we track Visa as a financial, even though, and that's why you see that our financial exposure is so high. It's not exactly valid because Visa, Visa is more a, a company in its own sector, if you want to put it that way. Uh, Visa is, still, still, is now our largest weighting, but you'll see even though we trimmed half our Amazons. Amazons are now down to still 6% just because of the recent growth. Um, NVIDIA, even though we trimmed, this is uh, basically because we bought NVIDIA originally when uh, there was that glut of graphics cards coming onto the market after the collapse in Bitcoin and all the Bitcoin miners were selling their, their graphics card. Uh, NVIDIA missed one quarter's worth of earnings, but there was no fundamental problem with the business. Uh, we managed to get it on, on about a 65% dip. Uh, it turned out to be one of the best performers in our portfolio. It just grew too quickly, unfortunately. Um, so we've been trimming it. We still like the business we still all, all those businesses we still have on a buy um, we were topping up on blackrock as well recently for clients so i'm still all five of those stocks i would be happy to buy even at these levels um, just our portfolio as, as part of the risk management uh, was a little bit heavy in them um, i've given you a relative outperformance graph on the strategy that we run uh, essentially, uh, we, you know, we went, to, as I said, 2017 was a difficult year. It was just every day it was half a, quarter, half a percent up, half a percent up, half a percent up, you know, flat for a couple of days, then up again. So it was a very flat year for us there as well. But we really have shown our performance in the most difficult times is when we've generated the most our performance for our clients. And that, again, it just leads me to really believe that... Um, you guys should be using asset managers. If you don't know how to do this, 1% uh, is a very low price to pay for having an expert in your corner. And finally, this is the last slide, because uh, I think I'm one minute over. But um, yeah, we're also launching new tax-free savings pricing for you. So we've got this new thing out. Um, and if you want to have a tax-free savings account, these are JSE tax-free savings accounts. So they sit in BDA accounts, which are broker dealing accounts. Um, we are not going to charge you anything. They are a loss leading product for us. And essentially you are going to get them for nothing. Um, the only fee that you will pay is 25 basis points brokerage. We can't get away from the straight IPL, which is minor. Um, I've actually got a statement here. I've come on just to the 20,000 Rand deposit. Um, it cost them, Three rand ninety seven in straight, and it, uh, the VAT on the transaction was eight rand. Um, the brokerage, uh, uh, you know, at twenty five bips, uh, so it's just under twenty thousand was their deposit was forty nine rand forty six. That's the only fee they'll pay on that money ever. If they sit in that uh, that product, they were buying the, the uh, Signia S and P five hundred ETF. Um, they can, uh, other than obviously Signia's fees that sit uh, inside that, that ETF, um, they can sit on that product indefinitely. We'll never charge them an admin fee. We'll never charge them a monthly fee, and they can have that product forever. There's only one caveat. This is a loss-leading product for us. It does cost us money to open your accounts. So the only thing that we ask you to qualify to get this amazing zero fee, zero management fee, zero deposit withdrawal fee, full online access, the ability to switch your account and do whatever you like, is we ask you to have one other product with us as well. Do an offshore transfer with us, have a, your stockbroking account with us, or buy into the managed portfolio, and you qualify for that product. We, we can't just give it to you as a standalone product. That is my only provisor. That's it. Um, easy steps to open the accounts. Um, you literally just go to our website, forward slash accounts, send us our FICA documents, and away you go. Cool. Gary, thanks very much. A uh, couple of questions coming through. Lorato asks, forecast projection of gold, do you think you can hit 1900 by the, ex by the end of 2020? Uh, Lorato, sure. I mean, 1900. I mean, I, Gary, I don't know what your thought is, but $1,900 is, what, 5% away. It's currently 1804, as I checked a bit ago. 1900 must be quite easy by the end of this year. I mean, I'm hearing folks talk 2000, 2200. Um, but yeah. Oh, I definitely agree with that. I think I think there's still a long way to go. So if you if you look at the what happened uh, in the last part of QE, and uh, when interest rates hit that zero bound problem, um, from the time that they slashed interest rates to zero, it took about three years for gold to peak. We're only in the beginning stages. The Fed is not going to hike interest rates, you know, foreseeably in the foreseeable future. Probably at least not in the next two years. Um, that means for me, gold is probably going to trend higher at least for another two years. I think you know. $2,200 an ounce, 
I don't know about by the end of the year, but I'd say if, you, if you're looking three years out, you could easily see $2,800, $3,000 an ounce. Very, very comfortable. Yeah, no, I concur. And an important point is just to note, it's not always going to be, it's not a linear line. It's going to be a bit bumpy along the way. Sure. Shout out to Adam, who just tweeted us. He's watching in darkness, but he's still watching us because he's got load shedding. Uh, Shane, you want the presentation? Uh, drop a mail or I will have it on the website uh, in a little bit. Gary's going to send it to me as soon as we have finished here. Um, we'll get that up and going. Uh, Gary, a question. Why gold and not miners? Gold miners. It's a good question. Um, it is a good question. So, yeah, we know we, we look at we look at gold miners as well. So there, there has actually been talk um, of holding gold miners directly in, in our funds, or at least in the managed portfolio um, as well. I think the concern around, like, I mean, gold miners. There's nothing wrong with buying a gold miner as well. And I mean, the gold miners have done exceptionally well. So if you look at something like Sylvania, you look at what's happening at the again, DRD's had a, a rough couple of weeks, but uh, DRD has been on an absolute tear as well. And the thing with a gold miner is when you see the gold price going up like that, they have essentially a fixed cost. So you get uh, essentially like operating leverage coming through. Um, if, if their all-in sustaining cost is at $900 an ounce and suddenly you used to have gold at $1,000 an ounce and they, they were making a bit and then gold suddenly goes to $1,800 an ounce, every, uh, every, every dollar that it moves up is just profit. So you get these huge expansions in their earnings. Um, and that, that results in huge jumps in share prices as well. I think the concern around gold miners just at the moment is that we are facing lockdowns. Many of these mines have been asked to operate at 50% uh, capacity. Um, when we had um, just before lockdown, um, we had Neil Fonderman walking around on this floor because I'm sitting on the media floor of the JSE. Um, it's, you know, he was saying that, you know, you can't run these mines at a 50%, you can't run them at 50%. That's, that's running at a loss. And I think if we are to go into more stringent COVID lockdowns, I think that the mining companies could potentially be hit because they will see their production numbers dropping off. And you're not going to see the full uh, feed through of the, uh, of, of the underlying metal price increase. Obviously, if you hold the underlying metal, you're going to see the, the full value. You're, again, you're not going to get kind of the exponential move that you will get in the gold miners, but you also avoid a whole lot of the risk. It was meant to be my low risk stock pick. So I can't yeah, but that's a great point. I, we, we, saw today, we saw today updates from uh, Anglo Kumba, that whole stable Anglo Platinum, et cetera. And you can see the pain that they've taken during lockdown. To, you know, if you're an open cost mine, which we actually have a lot of, but that's the industrial metals and the like, it's easier. But if you if you if you're going down shafts, fifty percent, you're either at a hundred or at zero. There, there, there's no sort of fifty. Mm -hmm. A question from Adam: uh, Minimum investment for managed portfolio is it contributed in rands or dollars? Uh, yeah, so so the managed portfolio is a it's a fully offshore portfolio. So we we take the the funds through ex, the, the exchange controls when we do it. Um, we you know we've got we do your, we help you with your tax clearances, all of that kind of stuff. So if you're doing under a million rand, it's um, it's you know, it's very simple. If you haven't taken money out uh, before, you literally just you know you sign a one-page document. It doesn't even go to the receiver. Um, if you want to use your uh, 10 million rand allowance, it takes 21 days at the receiver. We do all the paperwork for you. You basically have to uh, submit assets and liabilities as well as um, a, a proof of source of funds. 21 days later, you've got a you've got the ability to move 10 million uh, offshore. Um, we do it. We do it at a fraction of the cost of the banks as well. Uh, just because it's, again, it's, it's like our tax-free savings account. It's a bolt-on product. We're not there to make money off it. We're there to kind of build, build a, a, a network and a relationship of clients. Um, so we do the transfers for you. Um, the minimum is $50,000. We, we can adjust that down to about $30,000. But the problem with that is when we are holding 30 stocks overseas, there are frictional costs when we have to do your implementation. So um, I, would love to, I would love to make it $10,000 if I could. Uh, the problem is that there are minimums on these offshore exchanges that we can't buy below. Um, I can get you in for probably about thirty thousand dollars total. Uh, the problem, uh, the problem with that is your frictional implementation cost will be slightly higher than the normal implementation cost at fifty thousand dollars. Whether you're doing fifty thousand dollars or a million dollars, your your implementation cost is going to be the same. So uh, it's just it's more that minimum is there also to protect you just from. Uh, from basically an expensive execution. So like 50,000 is kind of what you want to aim at, but uh, we can potentially do 30,000, but your implementation will be slightly more expensive. Cool. Uh, question coming through, quick one from Gavin. Uh, the structured product, was that uh, 10,000 ZAR or dollar minimum? 
Okay, so that's a that's a ten thousand dollar minimum as well. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. So what are you talking at the moment? It's yeah. uh, six, six, 16, well, one thousand one hundred and sixty. It's getting late. One hundred sixty thousand. I was one hundred sixty five thousand rand, um, more or less. Again, we, we can do the uh, the conversion for you. Uh, that uh, we're running it through a local Lisp as well, so it actually makes the FICA administration very easy. It's the reason that we can get that product so okay. low. If you if you want to, yeah, so it, it's, it actually makes it really really simple. So um, if you want to do bigger tranches as well, and you want to hold them in an offshore stockbroking account, that's also possible. We don't have to put it on list. Uh, it is an exchange traded product as well, so we can um, yeah we can put it in a stockbroking account overseas if you like. Uh, the minimums are just higher there. Uh, it's all. Uh, question coming through the J one fifty, which is the gold mine index. Is there a way to buy it an ETF of that index? Uh, there is not you're going to have to unfortunately buy the stocks individually and create your own index. Uh, Brendan's asking about the czar. Someone was going to ask a really, really, really hard question. 15 bucks possible? I mean, I suppose the answer is with the czar, anything is possible, right? Oh, so any, anything is possible. So I, I, I saw, I saw seventeen seventy is kind of a, 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 at least uh, sixteen seventy is a, a big technical level. Um, reading, uh, we get a lot of uh, kind of flow information off the banks as well. Um, they are, you know, the, the predictions from the banks at the moment are that you you are probably going to get back into the fifteens at some point. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it comes with this huge caveat that uh, you know we're facing like an incredibly difficult situation in South Africa at the moment, and uh, you, you know if if the sentiment is to turn. Um, it might turn at 1601, and if you were waiting for 1550, it could be back at 19 quite quite quickly. Um, the the feeling is that you are still going to see the, the 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 weakening trend in in the currency resume until we sort out our fundamental issues. That, that those are the words of you know we get we get generally most of the big bank research here. Um, they say maybe. You know, they they sit on the fence like everyone else. Maybe maybe it'll get down there. I don't think they they definitely have seen no one predicting stronger than fifteen. So fifteen would be absolutely the bottom. Yeah, that's a good point. I haven't seen anyone talking longer than fifteen. Uh, Shane, gold ETF for Krugerrand. So I think everyone should have a Krugerrand when when you're bullish on gold. It impresses your friends. Make sure they're honest friends. Otherwise, you will lose your Krugerrand. Um, but otherwise, I prefer the, the ETF simply because I don't have to store it. I don't have to hide it. It's frictionless. I don't have to go to Santon and pick it up. I can just swim a click, click, and 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 own it. Uh, and then Shane, you're asking about costs and exchange rate differences of taking money offshore uh, versus investing in ETF. So an ETF is easier, obviously, in a South African ETF. But if you go offshore, you've got that initial uh, exchange rate transaction that's going to hit you. And and with respect to Satrix, is going to do it better than me or you will because they're doing a much bigger amount, etc. But what you then find is that the ETFs in the US are so much cheaper. Our cheapest S&P 500 ETF, I think, is 12 points. That's the one from Signia. Uh, the VOO in the US is three points. That's only 0.09%. But you know, if we've got 0.09% and it's got to be in somebody's pocket, I'd always rather it was my pocket. So you take a slight extra upfront cost to get the money offshore, um, but then that's a one-off, and then you, you you save a little every year. Ladies and gents, we'll park that there. We've run out of time, but always worth for Gary. Uh, Gary, really, really appreciate your time this evening. Uh, ladies and gents, appreciate your time for coming along. I know some of you had load shedding, uh, but hey, you know, watching Gary in the docks, and he, he was also in the dark, is uh, probably worth it anyway. <laughs> Everyone, the uh, video will be up uh, in the next hour. You've, we'll put it on our YouTube channel. It'll be on justonelap.com. Uh, I'll send Gary the link. He might want to put it on his website. Everyone, have a great evening further. Stay safe. And uh, if it's still cold where you are, stay warm because it's uh, cold out there. Cheers all.